good. So we're live in three, two, one. So good evening, everybody, and welcome to this another episode of uh, Shopware. Uh, innovative approaches in shockwave therapy. Uh, for further proceedings, I'll hand it over to our convener, Dr. Daniel Moe. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashok. Uh, thank you very much to Ortho TV for, for giving us the chance from the L L Ibero Latin American uh, Shockwave Society to have this meeting with very good friends. Uh, we will have Dr. Jose from Brazil. We will have Dr. Thomas Nedelka uh, from Prague, Czech Republic, who will be the next president of the International Society for Medical Shockwave Treatment. Uh, we have also our friend Dan Singh from Israel, who uh, will show us how uh, the shockwave is developing and, and the practice that uh, he has in Israel. So uh, we will begin with Dr. Jose Aid, who will give us a general context of how to get the best results with the use of both radial pressure waves and focus shock waves. Jose, whenever you want. Thank you, Daniel, and, and hello, my friends. It's a pleasure to be with you all here, and I appreciate your effort and the, the, the Orto TV to give us the opportunity to spread the correct technology, uh, this fantastic tool that we as orthopedic surgeons have in our hands to treat many disorders on musculoskeletal pathologies. May I share my, my screen here? Yes, go, go ahead. Perfect. Uh, yes, let's see. Yeah, it's okay. You can see. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, we can great. see it very well. Okay. Uh, when we talk about shockwave, we need to think about quality standards and basic application techniques about shockwave treatment. Uh, here you have uh, my, my compliance, nothing to declare. Uh, first of all, I want to, to invite all of you that are with us here to our uh, 23rd ISMST uh, Congress in Vienna, Austria. We will have the training and the uh, certification course presential to physiotherapists and for physicians in these days that you can see here in the screen and also the congress during these days and it will be fantastic because this was postponed from 2020 to 2021 so this is very important if you can share us presential or hybrid uh, uh, way. So uh, ISMST has done some consensus statement recommendations about the, the definitions and terms about shockwave. Who can, for instance, in Spain, we, we, we declare as a consensus statement that who, can, who is able to do focus or radio pressure wave. So you can see that focus shockwave is a, 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 a technique that must be used only by physicians and radio physicians and uh, physiotherapists or other technical uh, no physician professional from health. And they must be trained before do any type of radio or focus treatment. We have also done some introduction and prerequisites to standard, standard, standards uh, shockwave performing. As every medical field, we need to have a clinical examination, uh, the correct uh, interpretation of the radiological imaging and all these topics that are highlighted here 
as a qualified physician, and we cannot forget It seems that we have a connectivity problem. Let's give Dr. Aid some minutes. He told me that there was a very big storm in Sao Paulo and he was afraid of having pro connectivity problems. If not, we, the problem would be how to unshare. Okay, Jose? Can you hear me? Uh, you are mute. I have no light here, but I am using my my your phone. Four uh, G. Are you listening well? I, you listening? I can hear you. Yes, I can hear. Okay, you. the light goes back. Let's see. <laughs> give, give me. Give me. I. I'm sorry. We are having no, a very... I already said that there is a big storm in Sao Paulo. Yes, yes, but now it. But it seems the, the light it... comes back. So okay, you you yeah. will. But you can okay. I. Will... The problem is that the con your connectivity is not good, Jose. We can. You know, you are frozen many times. We'll continue. Tell me if it's something wrong, okay? Okay, Hello? you are frozen. Are uh, you listening you know, me? I can listen you, but uh, the, the, you are frozen from time to time. Let's okay. check it. I, I'm very sorry about this. Don't worry. Yes. Uh, Do you, you want this, us? Can, can you see the screen? No. Not yet. No. So I think what we can do is go ahead with Thomas and give you more time to check everything. What do you think? Yeah, we will do so, Thomas, because uh, yeah. it is very unstable, the signal, it seems to me. Yeah, yeah. So, uh... I'm going back to share my screen. I hope that we didn't encounter any storm uh, in Prague. <laughs> but I hope okay. that I will uh, uh, solve it. Good. Yeah. Thank you. So I think that screen is put on. Um, uh, Daniel, Dr. Ashok, and uh, dear organizers, uh, thank you very much to give me an opportunity uh, as uh, uh, next president of ISMST and also a uh, doctor who is doing not orthopedy but neurology and rehabilitation uh, to share some experience and also some evidence for neurological indications. I think that I hope everything is okay. If not, please interrupt me. Tell me if... Uh, no, we can see very well your screen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, when we are speaking about shockwave therapy in neurology, we are speaking about last decade of um, experience because uh, 20, 30 years ago, when uh, we used mainly high energy devices, uh, the nerves were, or the central nervous system, uh, was among um, the contraindications. And it was on the blacklist when we consider applications in central nervous system and, uh, and also in peripheral nerves. However, uh, first publications which were uh, oriented even on uh, the nerve treatment of nerve pathologies uh, brought completely new light uh, on uh, this type of uh, mechanical therapy, including ESWT, because uh, we know that there are some uh, type of devices, uh, even the pulse ultrasound devices used for some certain um, uh, central nervous system pathologies, uh, but they have something in common, and it's the delivering of uh, mechanical energy to the nervous tissue, including brain, including um, uh, peripheral nerves. And the prism which uh, focused the new light is called mechanotransaction, which is uh, studied for 
uh, last decade or decade and a half. Uh, what actually does mechanical load uh, when uh, extracorporeal shockwave therapy or radial pressure waves? Uh, there's some difference between them regarding the biophysical principles, but they lead to very different intracellular processes. Mechanotransduction is not destruction. So we are not destructing calcification, anything like that, but we are trying to induce uh, some biochemical process or biochemical or and um, other processes. And this um, leads to completely uh, different uh, view on shockwave therapy as a biological treatment, not only physical therapy itself, but it's uh, the biological treatment. Regarding the uh, central and peripheral nerve system, uh, we know that shockwave therapy from in vitro models uh, can stimulate intracellular signaling molecules and also gene expression in neurons. So we are speaking about signaling, but also into the protein transcription, including the various types of growth factors, which are very important to whole regeneration process. There are some differences between peripheral nerve and some uh, spasticity and possible effect in central nervous system. We know that uh, in peripheral nerve, shockwave therapy uh, can lead in animal model to suppression of apoptosis. We have uh, some changes in uh, various growth factors, activating transcriptor factors three, which leads to significant increase in neuritic uh, sprouting, it means into the nerve regeneration or axonal regeneration, and also to proliferation of Schwann cells, which are very important guiders for and guides for the whole um, uh, process of neurotic sprouting, for example, in uh, damage uh, in peripheral nerve. A completely different um, uh, situation is in spasticity. When we know that uh, the shockwave therapy is able to induce uh, synthesis in uh, nitric oxide, both uh, guiding to and eliciting the enzymatic and non-enzymatic way. Uh, this is forming uh, the new neuromuscular junction according to uh, animal model studies and also some uh, changes in um, the microvascular flow in the vessels of um, uh, low diameter. And uh, when we speak about completely new fields, it's two years old or something like that, uh, field of application of shockwave or acoustic pulses, we are speaking about that it's possible uh, use in neurodegenerative illnesses, which uh, absolutely opens another window um, uh, of use uh, of this type of treatment. Uh, it's certain that uh, ultrasound and maybe shock waves, it's not well studied yet, uh, can have its effect also on beta amyloid formation, which is very important, for example, when treating uh, the, neuro the neurodegenerative disorders like uh, Alzheimer's or something. First of all, first of all I, uh, I'm going to begin with spasticity because um, uh, it's a field of neurology where uh, the shock use of shockwave therapy is well proven. Uh, I think that everybody knows what spasticity means, but uh, it's the patho overall it's pathological condition with uh, increased muscle tone and uh, appearance of painful spasms and also increase in prim primitive reflexes, hyperreflexia uh, and uh, so-called irrit irritation signs, uh, Babinski and the other, which may uh, interfere with whole therapeutic process. It's following uh, very different uh, diseases, including MS, including post-stroke uh, spasticity and so on. It's a very wide field of uh, uh, problems after affecting patients with uh, uh, different neurological diagnoses. And it's very often, we know that uh, the overall prevalence for spasticity is 12 million worldwide, and even in, just in the US, it's 500,000 patients. The pathophysiology uh, of spasticity um, has uh, uh, different clinical symptoms. Uh, one of first of uh, them is the increase of monosynaptic reflex. And also we see muscle overactivity, but uh, muscle ineffectivity. 
its weakness. The spastic muscle is not as effective as uh, the healthy one. It leads also to abnormal posture. Uh, that means um, various um, uh, musculoskeletal systems can be involved to that due to the contract uh, contractures and uh, the uh, signs of spasticity, spasticity including um, so-called Wernicke Mann holding in upper and lower limb. In upper limb, we see uh, uh, the flexion posture in lower limb combination of extension and, um, and uh, supination. What are the current uh, evidence-based uh, principles? We differentiate between local treatment, uh, which uh, is usually, generally speaking, used where there is used um, uh, Botox therapy, botulinum toxin type A and B. Then we have uh, very promising results of shockwave therapy and very important role of physiotherapy and splinting to prevent uh, the increase uh, in spastic muscles. We have also oral treatment, including baclofen, clonazepam, and the other ones. Uh, and uh, in worst cases, intratecal baclofen therapy. And it's necessary to say those type of global um, or per oral treatment uh, does have um, adverse effects, including um, uh, dizziness, including uh, break of sleep architecture, uh, fatigue and the other ones. So we are trying to uh, influence the spastic muscles as locally as possible. What's the benefit of shockwave therapy when we use it against, for example, Botox? Because it seems that the Botox is still the gold standard in the treatment. Uh, in shockwave therapy, we don't have any adaptation according to our knowledge. Uh, however, some patients uh, which are treated by botulinum toxin uh, are producing neutralizing antibodies against this type of toxin. Uh, the human body has a, a tendency to uh, neutralize it uh, and um, this type of therapy, when we begin uh, to produce this type of antibodies, uh, it's not effective anymore. Uh, the limitation for the use of Botox is also a larger area of treatment where the dosage is uh, not always sufficient. And also we have larger muscle groups which are not logically, um, uh, um, uh, we cannot treat them uh, by the botulinum toxin because of the gross muscle groups. Uh, shockwave therapy is also non-invasive treatment. So mainly, for example, in children or and more sensitive patients, uh, they risk their response uh, to botulinum toxin uh, is uh, sometimes very poor. And in the low doses, the shockwave therapy has no adverse effects at all. It was proven in a couple of studies. Uh, I've uh, been speaking about the mechanism of action, uh, just uh, to repeat it. Uh, it's about the, the uh, nitric oxide synthesis and uh, the whole uh, enzymatic and non-enzymatic process uh, of increase in uh, nitric oxide um, levels. Uh, there are also some effects on, uh, if, uh, on uh, appearance of tendon tissue, uh, uh, which is um, uh, proven um, by the increased gene of uh, expression of TGF beta, and also electrophysiological examination where the EMG was used to examine the uh, uh, motor neuron function. Uh, found that uh, shockwave therapy uh, has uh, reduced the upper motor neuron hyperexcitability, uh, which is sometimes the limitation for us. Uh, it was used um, first in the study back to 1996, but uh, from my point of view, very important publication was published by Manganotti and his team uh, back to 2005. Uh, and they achieved very good results, uh, results against the placebo treatment. Uh, as we have seen on the previous slide, Manganotti uh, was uh, oriented mainly on upper limb uh, spasticity, but also publications uh, considering the lower limb um, 
spasticity exists too. For example, this very nice Sohn and others publication where ESWT was effective uh, and it was uh, preventing also the complication, including equinovirus deformity, and they were gaining more stable gait pattern. The systemic review by Professor Dimarek and his team uh, was proving both focused extracorporeal shockwave therapy and also radio pressure waves uh, uh, in uh, adult uh, spastic uh, population because uh, he um, uh, analyzed a lot of papers uh, in impact factor journals uh, and uh, the whole effect of the shockwave therapy was uh, positive and uh, he and it was proved that uh, its effect was uh, good. One study, uh, the study of uh, Professor Wu, uh, put extracorporeal shockwave therapy against Botox treatment, uh, and the results were that ESWT was a non inferior treatment alternative to Botox uh, for upper limb spasticity. And also, the shockwave therapy was uh, slightly better than Botox in wrist and elbow uh, ROM and also UE score, which is very important um, uh, outcome uh, uh, because the hand and uh, elbow, uh, elbow flexors and the wrist is very important for gaining or uh, obtaining the proper function of the limb. So uh, on this slide, I'm going to move slightly from uh, spasticity to peripheral nerves because this is one of the uh, very modern principles of treatment. Uh, back to 2012, uh, they were first finding that uh, peripheral nerve regeneration was induced by extracorporeal shockwave therapy in, uh, in the rats. So it was the animal model study. Uh, after that, uh, a lot of publications uh, came uh, to the world, including, for example, um, uh, Hausner's, uh, where uh, the uh, ESWT uh, improved axonal regeneration in the peripheral nerve, and also it led to improved removal of degenerated axons with uh, better uh, um, healing of the new, uh, injured uh, nerve axons. Um, back to 2007, it was very important publication where Wu uh, reported that ESWT was safe uh, against peripheral nerves, which is very important uh, um, uh, publication for us, uh, which uh, we have behind us when we are treating uh, the peripheral nerves. But it still belongs to very experienced personnel. We have to stay in lower uh, energies, but uh, it's good to have this behind us. Just there, repeating what uh, uh, we are able to achieve in peripheral nerves, so we can move on. Um, one of the most uh, uh, studied indication regarding the uh, nerve damage is the carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, let me please present the, uh, just the results of meta-analysis, which was published back in 2019. So it's still the recent study, uh, which was comparing uh, different uh, publications from 2013, the SERP ones, to uh, uh, the latest one in 2018, finding that SWT can improve uh, symptomatic functional outcomes and also electrophysiological parameters, including the, uh, the, um, valve, uh, the nerve conduction velocities and so on in those patients. Uh, when we are speaking about carpal tunnel syndrome, it's necessary to say that uh, what we are trying to influence um, uh, with the ESWT are the milder forms. It's, uh, we cannot uh, treat uh, the axonal loss with shock waves. There's the um, need for surgery, of course. But in mild forms of carpal uh, tunnel syndrome, uh, it's okay to use it as an, an, an junk protocol for, uh, for splinting and the other uh, conservative procedures. From my point of view, always it's necessary to combine the effective methods. In peripheral nerve injuries, um, uh, there was one article uh, which was published back to 2013, 
uh, and uh, the authors were um, pub publishing effects of extracorporeal shockwave therapy on denervation atrophy and also function by uh, after the sciatic nerve injury. So uh, when we are speaking uh, about the publications regarding the uh, nerve trauma, uh, it's still controversial because, for example, FDA uh, um, didn't authorize the ESWT to treat um, uh, the, uh, the nerves. Uh, however, other type of ultrasound, uh, of mechanotherapy, the ultrasound uh, was um, uh, was um, uh, uh, FDA approved. Uh, I think that this controversy leads uh, to need for further studies and maybe uh, for better uh, setup of uh, energy flux densities. When we are speaking about the treatment procedures in peripheral nerves, we have to uh, be very um, uh, careful and we have to use as low energies as possible. What's the future possibly in uh, central nervous system uh, is the use of uh, types of um, some types of um, uh, mechanical stimulation also in neurodegenerative diseases. Um, there are first articles which were uh, proving some effect of uh, acoustic. Uh, wave therapy uh, post ultrasound because we cannot um, uh, we cannot refer it to it to it as a shockwave therapy because in uh, central nervous system uh, the publication but they are using the same technique uh, of shockwave but uh, uh, in but in slightly different uh, procedure um, but in the central nervous system. Uh, we are not speaking about the shockwave therapy, but about uh, pulsed ultrasound. But as we see on uh, the following picture, you got the same uh, machine uh, for it, uh, and we've got a proper navigation uh, using the MRI, uh, uh, and the application zone is around the uh, temporal globe. It was uh, the the, pub, the publication of Beisteiner and his team was published in High um, Impact Factor Journal, uh, and uh, there is uh, no rumors that this may be the future. Uh, they had uh, very nice results, including the Serrat scores and also the uh, interference with daily activities with milder form Alzheimer disease patients. Uh, when we are speaking about um, the uh, shockwave therapy use or ac pulse acoustic wave, pulse ultrasound in neurodegenerative diseases, what are the background for it? Um, it's absolutely uh, necessary to say that more studies and also evidence is needed for uh, the um, for proving the certain mechanical uh, or the effect of the mechanotherapy because it's it still uh, has not to be clarified, uh, was not clarified. And also um, uh, it's necessary to say that maybe anti-apoptotic effect of uh, tau protein blockage uh, is suspected in this type of treatment. Uh, I think that this was uh, all from my side. Thank you very much for inviting me here and uh, looking forward to meet in Vienna this year. And also we are organizing the conference in Prague uh, next year in 2022 in September. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, Thomas. We, we enjoy very much your conference. It is clear that a new uh, field is opening with new indications uh, in the uh, neurology and I, I must confess I do not have much experience on these topics but I had the chance uh, supervised by Sylvia let's mention her because she was very enthusiastic about this and uh, I treated a couple of patients and really I was amazed by the results. Mm, I don't know, Dan, if you have uh, some experience or dealing with neurologic indications. Uh, no, not at all. No. Not at uh, Jose, all. what about no. you? No, I, I'm not, I don't have experience also, mm -hmm. nothing. 
but it seems to be very promiser this this yeah. area. Yeah, what uh, Dr. Vidalka said about carpal tunnel syndrome is very tempting to to try it for the mild cases, yeah. of course. Yeah, mild cases. It's very important to differentiate between the axonal damage of the nerve and just the slight demyelating uh, changes, which are um, uh, reversible. But when we are trying, uh, when we are talking about the CTS in uh, more developed forms, we've got an axonal loss, and we cannot uh, uh, treat it just with this type of therapy. Maybe post-operative, we can use it for scar formation, as a kind of adjunct therapy, but uh, it definitely the procedure will not be based on shock waves uh, regarding the developed stage of the CTS. Great. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, I will ask you please to unshare your screen. Yes. Uh, it seems Thank you that. that part. Yes. Uh, stop sharing. So. Thank Perfect. You. Perfect. Well, we know that uh, you have uh, some um, meeting that you need to be there. So we really uh, thank you for your effort and to. Thank you for teaching us uh, such amazing and interesting new uh, ideas and new indications. And of course, we are looking forward to be in Prague next year. We hope the COVID will let us. And it's a beautiful city and I, I would love to be there again. Thank you very much. Thank you to, forward to meet you there, everybody, and in Vienna. Sure. Is going to join. Bye bye. So, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Thomas. Well, it seems bye. that now the, the the signal is stable, Jose. We will end your presentation, uh, and then we will go ahead with Dan and finally me. Let's check if we can share your perfect your screen. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear and and see? Perfect. No problem. Okay. At all. So I am I am back. I'm sorry. You know uh, there was a shockwave in the sky of São Paulo with adverse effects on the transmitting antenna. It's not a complication. And now we are back to continue. So uh, about the the consensus recommendation from ISMST and on Lat Federation. Uh, the aim of this recommendation is to stand, standard to have standard indications and to prevent improper treatment. Also, to have the best scientific proof for focus and radio pressure waves. To do as all the medical field to have the local diagnostic and the differential diagnostic and qualified physicians to do and to get this aim. Uh, when we talk about diagnostic, we need to know the local diagnostic and the, this differential uh, diagnostics. So, so we have to use sometimes ultrasound or an MRI, as you can see here, to see soft tissue rupture or maybe a CT for bone. We know that CT for bone in control of non-union for non-union is better than MRI. So this is very important. When we talk about qualified standards, quality standards, we need to know and develop some topics. The influence, the position of the patient, how to localize and the quality guide of the devices. When we talk about positive influence, we must know the correct indication and we need to know also the contraindications. We need to know the concept of treatment. It's not a mechanical treatment. We have a biological effects and mechanotransduction as Thomas told us right now. We need to understand the physical principles. This is very important. Understanding the the device, how to use the device. And we need to be updated with current scientific information. As you can see here, we have a difference and we need to understand the physical principles. You can see that when we talk about shockwave, a focus shockwave, we have 
uh, speed of sound and uh, a wave that is completely different from a pressure wave. So you have uh, uh, the, the velocity of the sound or bigger for focus, and you have a speed of sound less than 10 meters per second if you go to radio pressure waves. You can see here that we uh, have different technologies. If you see this graphic, you, you see the shock wave, you see a, a diagnostic ultrasound device and the radio pressure wave. So they are completely different. This is very important for us to know and to, and to how to use these technologies in our favor. You can see here that every shock wave generation vibration body that you have a velocity of the sound equal or bigger than the sound you have the true shock waves. And if you don't have it, you don't have a true shock waves. When we talk about negative influences, of course, if you don't do a correct indication, it's not a, a good situation to have a good result. If you use low energy for bone pathologies, you, will not, you do not have the state of art in, in, in any treatment of bone. If you use very high energy for soft tissue pathologies, exception for calcarea tendinopathy that we know that we need focus and we need high energy. If you don't know your device, it's a negative influence. And if you ignore how deep your device goes, so you can have a bad result. In non-union, the same, if you, if you use a not focused devices or the gap is bigger than five millimeters, or if you use low energy, or small focus or incorrect area of treatment. The position of the patient is very important. Depending what are you going to treat, maybe you can put the patient lying or maybe sitting if you go to treat sometimes the, the, the shoulder disease. Also to localize the area, you can, you need to use, you must use a radioscopy, a fluoroscopy for big bones or to treat a non-union. You can also, in tendinopathy, use a feedback of the patient that we know that you don't need to use a, a big device, or ultrasound to, to do the treatment. To localize the area, you need uh, 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 the crosshair, and you go directly, as you can see here. Uh, I can, I can, I have here in this case. You can see in the in the the the, the, the cross here. I will show you in the next slide here. The position of the patient. Also, if you see the the image from your right side, you can see the screen with a cross hair. In the shoulder, this is an isocentric arm. It's an old hippos uh, ultra, it's an old device. And you can use the ultrasound inline system in the left uh, image. You cannot forget the gel. The gel, this is very important because you can, you must avoid air bubbles to avoid not only the uh, loss of energy, but to avoid hematoma. So gently, but firmly press the application to the skin, as you can see in the picture. Here is a good example, the direction of the impulse. You need to go for the shortest way, targeting the pathology. So F1 here, you can see uh, is the generator. F2 is non-union of omerus. During the procedure, you can see the crosshair here in the uh, non-union localization, and you can see the results of this treatment after nine months. This patient had two surgeries before shocking due the shockwave, including graft bone and change in the plate. Here also, you can go directly because this is a superficial bone, so it's easy to to treat, you can see a clip here because I put a clip, uh, I do a simple X-ray to confirm the position and you see the control CT showing the complete resolution of non-union of shock wave of, of the scaphoid bone. Always do the ultrasound before 
uh, ESWT to localize, localize the vessels. As you can see here, this is a uh, orthopedic surgeon uh, from Argentina with necrosis of both hips. And we did this treatment. You can see the crosshair in the image in the up and left side also in your screen. So the vice manual, what is written? What are the legal recommendations to keep you in, in high uh, state of art? The professional must be familiar with the device and the current medical literature. Responsibility of the users. You must read and understand your, man, your devices, reading the, the manual for sure. And message for home, to, to take, uh, take a message home, physicians and other professionals, healthcare should know the correct indications, contraindications and adverse effects. The current with ISMST and non lot recommendations, direct correlation between number of shock waves, intensity and adverse effects, and knowledge of complications, of course. And the education is our answer. Everybody that wants to uh, learn about shockwaves must do uh, uh, courses by international or, fed or, or federation on that or other national societies to give you the correct indication using the best scientific evidence for shockwave treatment to avoid misunderstanding and medical errors. Conference and meeting with the health private and public system should be very nice because you can share and clarify all the recommendations always based in scientific evidence, including the correct, including the correct contraindications. And last but not least here, we have also in November, the uh, set talk and online Congress in Madrid it will be a wonderful Congress. And this is an invitation for you all to be present in this Congress. So thank you very much for your attention. And I am sorry again for this shockwave in the sky of Sao Paulo, but I think that I could give you a message, a miscellaneous message about shockwave treatment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. Well, uh, it is important to be aware of the consensus. Uh, you and me, we know because we were involved that to um, create a consensus take a lot of time, a lot of discussion, and it is based on the scientific literature and the scientific evidence. Uh, and that's why, at least in ONLAT, we are really very uh, respectful about the ISMT consensus and we try to spread uh, that specifically related with the nomenclature, the incumbencies and the type of devices that are recommended for each uh, endorsed indication. We will learn now how is the situation in Israel. Israel uh, has a, a very long story related to shockwaves, even companies uh, producing shockwaves devices for a very, very long time. In fact, I used a shockwave device built in Israel for a long time. So uh, I, I am really very excited to and eager to listen to Dan and tell us how is the development, the, the indications, and how they work in Israel. Shalom, Dan, welcome. Thank Hello, you for Shalom. joining me. Thank you, Dr. Moya. I'm Dr. Dan Sin. I'm an orthopedic surgeon in a medium-sized uh, general hospital near Tel Aviv. I do foot and ankle surgery and trauma surgery. I'm dealing with shockwave for more than 15 years already, first at the hospital and later on in my uh, private clinic. And I would like to share my experience uh, with you. Um, Dr. Moya asked me 
to share my experience and I'm willingly excited. So thank you, uh, Daniel. So before I speak about myself, I want to present you the situation about chocolate in Israel to illustrate the sorry, situation. Sorry, Dan, excuse me. Uh, we do not see the complete screen. It's a pity because uh, it will be better to see the, you know, the full screen. Okay. Yes. So let me share again. Okay. Perfect. Better now? Now it's great, great. Thank oh, you. Okay, thank you. So um, let me illustrate the, the situation in Israel. Well, uh, the only regulation concerning uh, shockwave is uh, about the devices. Uh, it uh, must be registered and licensed, but there is no regulation concerning the, uh, the operators, the providers of the, of the service. Um, there is no... Uh, uh, there is no scientific uh, society in Israel that can support such uh, regulation. As a result, or not as a result, uh, the current situation is that most people that activate chocolate devices are not doctors. Many physiotherapists use uh, radial waves uh, as part of the treatment techniques, but others uh, use it as well, like chiropractors and so-called alternative therapists, uh, which I don't really know what, how deep is the uh, medical uh, knowledge. Uh, I believe that only few people in Israel have done the uh, certification course of the ISMST. Another aspect is, of course, uh, about uh, money. Uh, shockwave therapy is not included in the public health insurance, so patients must pay for the service. Some of them are refunded by the private uh, health programs, health insurance. So this is the world of shockwaves that I'm working in. I'm a senior orthopedic surgeon, the only Israeli member of the International Society, and I'm trying to give uh, the best professional medical uh, service. So uh, I opened uh, my patient's files from uh, 2018 to 2020 and uh, collected the data. I found 244 cases, uh, nearly equally divided men and uh, women. 85% of them had a uh, unilateral problem or they preferred me to treat only uh, one side. You can see in the diagram that most patients were middle-aged, between 40 and 70 years old. The patients that come to me have the classic orthopedic indications for shockwaves. The vast majority have plantar fasciitis, then Achilles tendinopathy, mostly uh, insertional, Calcific tendinitis of the shoulder, trochanteric bursitis, and elbow epicondylitis. The results are uh, very good, uh, resemble those in the literature. Uh, non insertional Achilles tendinopathy is much less common in my shockwave clinic. I believe that this is because uh, non insertional Achilles tendinopathy has less tendency for chronicity and patients are healed with conventional therapy. As for non-calcified shoulder pathology, I rarely treat patients with uh, rotator cuff tears. Uh, Dr. Moira, you are a shoulder surgeon. Maybe you will comment about it uh, later. In the last two years, I began to treat also a knee osteoarthritis and trigger fingers. The number are still too small to share. 
I would like to present now uh, two special cases that came to my foot clinic. The first is a 64 years old male uh, who had, had a cumulative intraarticular fracture uh, of his calcaneus and was treated by open reduction and internal fixation. At one year follow up, he still complained of pain in uh, weight bearing. So these are, this are the X-rays and the CT scans, and you can see one line of non-union over here. And this is the, the CT. You can see the non-union uh, line. So I treated him with a single session of 3,000 high energy uh, shockwaves. At six weeks, the extra examination uh, showed signs of bone built up. And at uh, three months, nearly full union of the fracture was achieved. And the patient reported a significant clinical uh, improvement. I'm still in touch with this patient. Uh, I gave shockers to his wife for trochanteric bursitis. Now it's five years after, and he's doing very, very good with his uh, foot. The other case is of a 68-year-old male who had bilateral calcaneal fractures 20 years ago. In 2018, he had arthrodesis of his left subtalar joint. But at follow-up, he still complained of pain in weight bearing. This is his CT scan that demonstrated the non-union of the arthrodesis. You can see it over here and over here. Um, he was uh, offered a revision surgery and came to my clinic uh, for consultation. So on July and August 2019, I gave him two sessions of 3,000 high energy shockwaves, one month apart. He had clinical improvement for six months. And in January 2020, I gave him two more sessions. I found him last week, a year and a half after the shockwave, and he's very satisfied and reports only minor and short events of pain. I'm sorry I do not have a new CT scan. I think there's an ethical problem to expose to irradiation, a patient that recovered just for me to have the pictures to show you. But believe me, he's doing great after uh, he, he was advised for vision surgery for autodesic non-union. A few words about my treatment protocol. You all know that uh, shockwave uh, triggered the tissue regeneration and the healing process by activating the cellular immune system. The clinical response is slow and takes up to three months uh, to assess the results of the treatment. I usually have three uh, sessions, one every two weeks. After the last session, I wait for a month and then talk, talk with them to assess their progress. Sometime I need to give them a booster treatment, but that is only when I see a good but not sufficient response to the first uh, free treatments. I don't uh, see any logic in giving more treatments to those who didn't respond at all. Few words about uh, radio compression waves. In the last uh, two years, I began using uh, the radio wave device, and I use it for uh, elbow epicondylitis, for trigger fingers, and other superficial tendinopathies like the pyramidal. Uh, uh, tendons. The protocol here is different. I give a uh, weekly uh, treatment for five or six uh, times. I had uh, one interesting case of a young woman with bone edema of the sesamoid bone under the head of the first metatarsal. Um, after five sessions of uh, radial waves, she had a significant clinical improvement. And today, more than a year later, she's free of pain 
serving in the army as a sport instructor. It is important to be to, to select your patients correctly. I'm looking for those with the, the chronic cases that suffer around six months and, and more. Um, it's, uh, it's unacceptable to take a person that suffers for one month and offer him a treatment and uh, that, uh, well, you will be better in three months. You go to, some, to, to another place. So I prefer the chronic uh, cases that uh, already failed with the conventional uh, treatment modalities. Uh, some patients uh, come after they got uh, steroid injections to the shoulder or to the plantar fascia. So I always wait at least one month after the injection. Uh, I believe that the steroids suppress any uh, biologic uh, reaction uh, including the, uh, what we want to achieve with the shockwave. As for knee osteoarthritis, uh, I take those who are not candidate for replacement surgery. Uh, these are usually uh, active young patients, relatively young, around 60 years of age, with moderate disease, as you can see in this uh, X-ray. Of course, of course, with this uh, patient, with neostatistis, I don't promise them that the cartilage will grow, uh, but only uh, relief, uh, temporary relief of the pain and better function. Uh, the most important factor for successful shockwave uh, treatment, as Dr. Jose uh, mentioned, is a well-established diagnosis. Uh, for example, in the shoulder, X-ray is not enough. Uh, first of all, not every calcification you can see in the X-ray. And second of all, you need to know exactly where the disease is, what tendon is involved. So I always do uh, the ultrasound uh, first and uh, to make a, a true diagnosis. Uh, the second thing is that uh, when you are sure about what you are treating, you can uh, put aside cases that are not suitable for shockwave. So you, you avoid uh, sure failure. I use a device with a large uh, focal zone. It means that the size of the therapy zone is 26 millimeters in diameter and 96 millimeters deep. With such a large focus, I don't need any uh, special imaging. I aim to the point of maximal tenderness or use anatomical guidelines. If we go back uh, to the shoulder, uh, when uh, the supraspinatus tendon is involved, I come from the lateral side of the shoulder, as you can see in the picture. But when the uh, subscapularis is involved, uh, then the, the machine is in front of the patient, in front of the shoulder, with the arm in external rotation to bring the tendon uh, forward uh, against the, the machine. In the knee, I aim to the subchondral bone. You know that the cartilage has no nerve endings. Uh, so what is painful is the subchondral bone. So I aim it to the involved compartment, uh, mostly the medial tibial plateau or in valgus knees, I aim it to the lateral tibial plateau. I find the large focal zone device very rewarding, both for me and for my uh, patients. Uh, this device delivers a large amount of uh, energy with uh, better results, uh, but nevertheless, the energy density is not so high. So the pain, the patient tolerates the pain better. And in most cases, I don't need to use any local uh, anesthesia. 
So for the end of this uh, short talk, uh, I want to say that I truly believe in uh, shockwave uh, therapy and uh, this, the ability of this technology to induce tissue regeneration. We choose to treat those pathologies that are resistant to conventional therapy, and many times are frustrating to both patients and therapists. I find it fascinating that chocolates are a link between physics and biology. We give pure physical stimulation and see a clear biologic response. You must not expect a quick clinical improvement. Be careful to guide your patients accordingly. My dream and my goal is to establish a chocolate society in Israel and host the annual meeting of the ISMST, the International Shockwave Society. So thank you for the opportunity to speak in front of this, in front of this respected audience. It is a really a great honor. I hope to see many of you in Israel. You are always welcome. If you have any comments or questions, don't hesitate and send me an email. So, Dr. Moya and everyone, thank you again. Thank you very much, Dan. It was a very nice presentation and you gave us a very clear uh, idea of what is going on in Israel. Uh, feel that uh, you will have all the support from our federation that includes Spain and the most important uh, Latin American societies. Uh, to help you and to support the developing of uh, Israeli uh, society for, sh for shockwaves. If we need to make the big sacrifice to go there and help you with uh, <laughs> ICC, there is no problem, we will do so. So it would be great. would be great. Good, of course, of course. No, no hesitation, no, no doubt about that. Okay, we will end this webinar giving some bad news that as we can see with Jose that the electricity disappeared because of a shockwave. Well, sometimes shockwaves can give us problems, but we can, if we apply the, the consensus and the recommendations given both for, from Jose, by Jose and by Dan, uh, get rid of many problems and prevent those problems. So I will talk about poor results and complications. And uh, you know, we, we have seen uh, uh, along the years that in many societies in which an instrument or a procedure is a study, uh, sometimes there is a kind of collective psychosis that everyone wants to show that this, the procedure is perfect and works for everything. But we want to, to give you a very balanced um, idea of the good points and the bad points. And there is no medical procedure that can give a solution to everything. Uh, one of the points that we, we must consider is related with um, the bad results and experience about that, the poor results. Uh, in the Congress that was organized uh, some years ago, back in 2017 in Spain, we presented a survey that included more than 100 members from the uh, International Society of Medical Shockwave Treatment, including 35 countries. And around 20% of them respond that they have seen complications when dealing with shockwave therapy. There was a majority of orthopedic surgeons because we know that we face more complicated situations like non-unions, and we generally treat patients with focus waves and high level of energy. So it is not a surprise that we need to face these kind of complications. Uh, the 
the list of different situations was very long. Uh, we can see that they are going from one fall from the table to a pneumothorax or a hemothorax. So we must be aware of this. We published this year, at the beginning of this year, um, at the Spanish uh, Medical Rehab uh, Journal, a article about these kind of situations uh, that was an article written from ONLAT or by ONLAT Medical, uh, ONLAT uh, Board. And we divided the poor results in three types. Those related with a diagnosis, diagnostic error, something that Dan have just pointed out, be sure of the, the diagnosis, a technical failure or a complication. If we speak about a diagnostic error or a technical failure, we know that there is someone responsible of that. Instead, a complication is an unexpected the, an unexpected bad result that uh, appears related to the nature of the pathology that we are treating or the nature of the procedure we are using. Let's begin by analyzing the diagnostic errors. Diagnostic errors in medicine are common. If not, we must consider this paper done by a uh, Health Agency of the United States. And one of the conclusions was that most Americans will get a wrong or let, late diagnosis, at least one in their lives. So the same is reflect in shockwave therapy. This is a study that was presented in the International Congress of our International Society in 2008. And the authors analyzed that 67 cases initially diagnosed as plantar fasciopathy, in fact, were three ankle fractures, eight compressions of the tibial nerve, six ganglia, seven hyperuricemia situations, and 18 trigger points at the triceps surralis. Of 60, 56 cases initially diagnosed, diagnosed as tennis elbow, 18 were pain propagated from trigger points and nine presented nerve compression at different levels. Of six, 76 patients diagnosed as calcific tendinopathy, 14 have no calcific, calcified tendinosis and 46 have rotator cuff injuries. This is another study by Buselli presented at the same meeting. And in a series of patients referred to their center to be treated with shock waves, they found a high percentage of discrepancies be between the referral diagnosis and their own diagnosis. This is another paper. This was presented in the Congress that we organized in Argentina in 2015. Um, this paper by some colleagues, Dr. Berati from Venezuela, uh, said that uh, there was a high incidence of error in patients with a presumptive diagnosis of plantar fasciopathy treated with shockwave without results. This is another paper that evaluated 51 cases of epicondylar insertional tendinopathies and found three patients with poor results that in fact were a case of humeral osteochondritis, a nerve compression at the frost arc, and a radio ulnar synovitis. Here we can see a paper published about a case that was treated with shockwaves several times, considering that was a plantar fasciitis and in fact was a calcaneal osteomyelitis. This is a case that, you know, I am a shoulder surgeon and I see many of these cases, a, base that, a patient that was referred to me to decide if he should have an open or uh, an arthroscopic surgery because two surgeons advise him to have an arthroscopic surgery because of this image on the rotator cuff and another surgeon advised an open surgery. So he wanted me to decide open or arthroscopic surgery. But the three surgeons didn't see what was going on 
on the human head. And that's why I am very concerned about the overuse of ultrasound and sometimes not using x-rays because we cannot see what is going on under the rotator cuff. In fact, this patient had a metastasis of a prostate cancer. And I can tell you that I see many patients like this and the worst thing that we could do is to indicate shock waves or radial pressure waves or PRP or whatever. And if we do not see what is going on under the rotator cuff. Why do these things happen? Well, could happen because of ignorance, excessive enthusiasm. I have just bought my, my device even lack of scruples, or sometimes a mixture of, of all these reasons. We must consider that having a device do, does not make us experts in all musculoskeletal pathology. There is another group of complications or poor results related to technical failure, and Jose Aid was very clear about this. If you have a technical failure, the responsible could be the professional or the device that was used. But we must know that between 50 to 70% of all incidents related to medical equipment are due to user errors. The professional should have the ability to make an accurate diagnosis, or if it is a physiotherapist, to receive the patient with an accurate drug diagnosis, because the responsible for a diagnosis is the doctor who has all the tools to make a clear diagnosis. The one who is going to apply the radial pressure waves of the, or the shock waves must have knowledge of surgical anatomy, especially for using focus shock waves, and the chance in some pathologies to indicate pre and post shockwave studies to solve acute complications. There are cases in, in, one in, in, when, in which there are some uh, complications like, like patients that have faints during the treatment and the ability to recognize the chronic complications. This is the consensus by the International Society of Medical Shockwave Therapy and the consensus by the uh, Ibero-Latin American uh, Shockwave Federation. And it is considered that focus waves should be, should be used only by physicians because of the level of risk of these devices and because of the type of indications that they have. Some people say, okay, I have a radial pressure waves and this was used to be named shock waves as, as well as focus waves. So the, the name is very similar. I can use this device to treat non-unions. Well, I always say I, can, I could perform a surgery with a knife, but I, perf I prefer a scalpel. And it is a very clear recommendation from the ISMST that bone pathology and calcified tendinopathies are indication for focus waves. It is not a good idea to use a tool that was designed for some task in an, another type of task. It could be dangerous. This was a patient I received that was treated by a physiotherapist this patient had a calcification of the rotator cuff. She was treated with radial pressure waves and developed a big hematoma. And the calcification did not disappear. And what it was even worse, this professional was not trained as a, a professional applicator of waves. The device he used was not register in the agency, health agency in charge of that uh, process. And he was using uh, radial pressure waves in an indication for focus waves. So as you see, generally people who do things in a wrong way is very coherent and do everything in a wrong way. So we must state that 
to have a device does not make us a specialist in everything. What about complications? As I said, they are unexpected situations. And we must learn, learn from the uh, urologist. We can see that the use of focus waves close to the uh, organs, especially the organs who have air inside, uh, make, uh, could make us have big complications. There are even uh, deaths that were um, attributed to the use of focus waves. They are burns that are also um, in the literature. And uh, that made uh, the urologist say that it appears that what was once considered an entirely safe means to eliminate renal stones can elicit potentially severe and intent unintended consequences. So we must be aware of that. In the world of musculoskeletal pathology, Sisterman in 1998 was the first to mention this, and he described hematomas, hyperventilation episodes, and hyperintensive uh, crisis. I have seen petechial hemorrhages, hematomas, uh, you have seen, sharp pain, frozen shoulder after the treatment of calcified tendinopathies, and syncope that, that was uh, common, uh, especially treating shoulder. Uh, we can see sometimes uh, situations like this one, I, I agree, it's a very, uh, it's not a severe, it's a very mild complication, but we can see this type of complications. Uh, as well, different types of hematomas, even wounds of uh, um, in the skin, as this case that Jose sent me once. This is a patient I treated with one session, after one session of focus waves, developed edema on his arm. I stopped and I wait till there was a resorption of the edema and we went back and treat the patient again again, and finally his calcification disappeared. It has been recommended to avoid areas with big vessels and nerves. This is a paper published by Professor Wang, and he treat dogs in the area of the femoral artery, vein, and nerves, and uh, demonstrated there was an important damage of these structures. We have seen the report of ul ulnar neuropathy. Uh, there are some cases that are appearing after treating the medial elbow, even with radial pressure waves. Sometimes they, um, some authors have said that there was a rupture of the Achilles tendon related to the use of shock waves. And I do not agree with that because it is part of the nature of that disease that sometimes wherever you do, you will find a, a rupture, a spontaneous rupture of the Achilles tendon. There have been reports of two cases of osteonecrosis of the humeral head after treating calcified tendinopathies of the shoulder. And these reports were done in very important journals. But what we must consider is that in some cases, these patients received uh, corticosteroids before developing these kind of complications. Even there is a case that was not published uh, by Dr. Gilov from Chile, and he told me that he had a case of osteonecrosis of the human head after using radial pressure waves. So we must be aware of this. This is a case of spontaneous pathological fracture of the calcaneus after a session with focus waves. There is a paper, a very interesting paper, that shown that there were teratogenic um, complications with the treatment of an uh, embryo of uh, chickens and using radial pressure waves. And they uh, announced that we should be aware of treating 
women uh, that could be pregnant uh, in the area of the abdomen, for instance, in aesthetics. We feel that the requirements to avoid problems are to have, as Dan said, a very accurate diagnosis or receive the patient with an accurate diagnosis to rule out other pathologies, as Dan said, not only an X-ray, but also, for instance, ultrasound in the shoulder, uh, to have a good device that is approved by the uh, health agencies and to be a trained and certified professional. And we feel that the chance of having a uniform instruction uh, is a very good way to have a uniform way of treating patients. That's why in Latin America, we have an online uh, uh, instructional course that uh, give us the chance to be trained in the same way if you are in Tierra del Fuego or in Mexico. Uh, we want all doctors and uh, physiotherapists to have the same, at least the same information, theory, theoretical information. Then they make their training, their practice in each country. In 2015, we make an inquiry and uh, the audience uh, had the chance to vote and almost 30 percent uh, said that they had some time of litigation in relation to shockwaves application and we have seen that there are some lawsuit website that are looking for complications in the US with the application of shockwaves. So we must be careful and try to do things in the right way. If not, we will have problems. Thank you very much. So uh, we have five sessions till now with good news, but it is good to know that every new um, every new solution brings new problems as well. So um, we must be aware of that. I think, Dr. Moya, that uh, if, we, if you fulfill the, requir the requirements that you stated, which are very true, then it's important to emphasize that shockwave therapy is a very safe uh, modality. And the complication yes. you showed are very rare. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. And if we do things accordingly to recommendation and consensus, and we have a good device, it is very unusual to uh, have a complication. But uh, we also know then that for a long time, we were a very small group of physicians mm -hmm. performing mm -hmm. shockwaves, and we were all in touch. But now the method is going to be spreaded, and many it people have <laughs> access to it. And we have seen in Latin America that as the number of people involved in shockwaves is growing, complications are growing. Of course. Yeah, yeah. So that's why we want to show this to uh, make people be uh, aware of the possibility of complications and avoid them. And you should uh, instruct, uh, guide the, the public to go to the professionals. Yes, yes. And some companies are very helpful with this, but some companies have their own system of training and sometimes that's not enough. Jose, do you want to say something from the ISMT point of view? I agree completely with you, Daniel, because we see here, uh, I'll give you an example, uh, a physician that know that uh, we have uh, 
standard approval with evidence for plantar fasciitis and he just treated with a little tripter in his hospital, the patient with a plantar fasciitis and he used high energy with the little tripter. You know, and you know that the patient had a big bone edema, you know, only problems. And, and he thinks that, he thought that uh, if you have a, a little tripter, you can do it. So this mm -hmm. is not true. He does not have uh, complete information. And now he is aware of this. So we have a lot of examples of complications for uh, your, your nice uh, explanation about error of diagnostic, or if you don't know the device. And for sure, the responsibility is the physician. Uh, for these complications and errors. So a lot of people are using and they must be aware and we need to educate all these people to use the correct indication, the correct device and the companies, the industry must help us to not sell the device. Um, you know, Industry wants to sell the devices. They are correct in their point of view, but they cannot uh, do a, a very fast training to this physician and stimulate them to do a correct certification course to have his knowledge and to protect himself. This is very important. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and to protect the name uh, and the prestige of the procedure, because if yeah. not, we have seen that uh, with other techniques that if you do not keep in, if you do not protect the way the procedure is used, uh, the idea of that procedure is getting, you know, the bone stocks are, are going down. So yeah. I, I think uh, the point is that the scientific societies, we have a very important role to uh, be involved in education and to give the advantages of, and disadvantages of each method. method. Yeah, and this, this uh, join of OnLAT and Orto TV to spread the correct use of this technology is of great value. So yeah. I thank you for your effort and for the Orto TV organizers to give us this opportunity. Well, uh, I also thank Ortho TV. I also uh, thank you two gentlemen. Thank you very much uh, for you, the great information you have and clear information you have given us. And I'm sure that in the future, we will have more projects together. Uh, you know, Dan, that uh, Argentina has a very big Jewish community. And in some way that, yeah. Uh, that would be give us the chance to do things together. And perhaps in, if no one realized that, we will include Israel in the Ibero-Latin American Society <laughs> Federation. That would be great. And, and, would then, be interesting, and then we, we uh, ISMST has around 25 or 24, I'm not sure, national societies. And if you need something for us to, to help you to create your society in Israel, it will be very nice. And we are uh, available for what you need for us. Thank you. Us. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me where is well, the, that shall... beautiful, Dan, what, where is the, that beautiful picture that you posted here? Is Tel Aviv? No. Oh, ah, yeah. The, the last picture is Tel Aviv, yes. Ah, okay. The coast Great. of Tel Aviv. Yeah, great picture. Okay. Very nice. Yeah. That's why I chose Dr. it. Ashok. Good. Dr. Ashok, thank you very much. Uh, we you. always are in depth with you for your support. And uh, from Israel, it will be very easy to go to Mumbai. So yes. I yeah. think we, we can organize something in India. I know that there are many doctors and many physiotherapists from India 
that are following these sessions and uh, I am in touch with several of them and, and they are very happy to be uh, you know involved very slowly in in this technique absolutely good okay have a great weekend all of you and we will thank be you. in touch thank you. thank you very much thank you, thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.